welcome to the show, Judith Regan. Hey, Judith. Hi, Mr. Galinsky. Good to see you. Good to see you. Love those flowers. Uh, Are those for me? Yes, they were. I customize every time for yeah. my guests. And these, I thought, you know, you always make me feel good and alive and colorful. You're so, so adorable. I brought you the palm tree. I carried it on my yeah. shoulder. I love that. Where are you in Puerto Rico? Yeah, I'm in Puerto Rico. Nice. I have a yeah. good friend down there in Aguadilla near Rincon. Yeah, love it. Um, love so it, love it. Very excited to have you on. You have met, so let me just shout out some people in the uh, chat room because it's already packed. Becky Savell from Simi Valley's there, Jack Fuller, Turco Ono, Callie Greenberg, Charles Massey, Tammy T, Lillian Binder, Amy Alt, my brother Andrew. Uh, Michael Riccardi is with us. Elizabeth Harder is with us. Jane uh, Turco Ono says, welcome, Judith. Um, Love it. Hi, everybody. Yeah. You have a nice crowd. It's a great crowd. Everybody's saying hi to each other, too. Um, so you have met, in my estimation, you have met probably every famous person that's ever walked this earth. Not every. <laughs> Not every. Close. Close to it. Um, you're, you're a publisher, a producer, um, and a, a host. A mother. A mother. A, a daughter, grandmother. A grandmother, a daughter, an adoptee mother, a stepmother, all that kind of good stuff. <laughs> and you've got, let's- this goes on and on. And my son's having another baby. Oh my gosh. I know, it's, just co it's like crazy, all crazy. What a time to have a kid too, right? It's crazy. So you, um, Let's actually, I, mean, I told you we we're going to start with something else, but I, I just came, came to my mind. Tell us about Carvel ice cream, your relationship you know, with it. Yeah. <laughs> I love Carvel ice cream. All right. So I was 16 years old and I couldn't wait to get a job. You know, my parents never gave me anything and they would never give me any money. Uh, my assistant is leaving. Goodbye. Bye. She wants to say goodbye. She was, she's, she's great. saying goodbye to everybody. Well, anyway. Good. Um, I learned at an early age, if you want to get something and you want to own something and you want to have something and you want to be something, you have to do it yourself. So I was very excited, by the way, to get a job at Carvel. I started, and this is how old I am, at $1.60 an hour. I thought I was rich. <laughs> and I would say that of all the jobs that I've had in my life, and I've had many, it was one of the best jobs I've ever had because I got to be very social. Uh, I got to be creative because we would, I would do, I would decorate these sheet cakes, these massive ice cream cakes. I love drawing. So oh. people would come in and tell me it was their birthday or anniversary and they tell me what they like and I would draw and paint these amazing things. So I became very famous for decorating cakes and I loved it. And then I employed all my friends. I ended up managing the place. We had chamber music, art contests. So it was like a cultural center for our little town. And, and I think there's a lesson in all that because no matter what the job is, I've always like tried to be creative, tried to bring a lot to the equation. You know, it was never about the money. It was always about the adventure and making it as exciting and interesting as possible and having a great time with my friends. And that job, you know, in addition to gaining 10 pounds and eating a lot of ice cream, <laughs> well, in the chat, I had a it, lot of fun. Amy Alt says, I love the caramel chocolate bonnet. And Yum! And Fudgy the Whale. <laughs> well, Perko Ono just asked, did you ever meet Tom Carvel and Fudgy the Whale? Well, it's really funny. I did meet Tom Carvel because I was so famous for my cake decorations and people would come from far and wide. And he would call me from time to time really? and say, Judith, this is Tom Carvel. You're doing a great job. Cookie puss. Yeah. Cookie he, puss. Gave me, like, he never gave me a raise. <laughs> I never got a bonus, <laughs> but I did get a lot of thanks. And then how did you go from, because you're an artist. You, I've heard you sing. You have a beautiful voice. I know you are a visual artist. And how did you transition from that into what you're, what you're really known for in terms of publishing? I mean, you're probably one of the most powerful publishers in the world. So how did you transition or what was the next step? From Carvel to Simon & Schuster to my own publishing empire? Um, you know, a lot of hard work. A lot of late nights, a lot of weekends, um, a lot of thinking and dreaming and a little scheming. And, um, you know, I worked really hard. I started 
after I went to college, I started at the National Enquirer as a reporter. And it was an amazing adventure. And this was back in the 70s. Uh, and people didn't want to work at the Enquirer. But again, whether it was Carvel or the National Enquirer or having my own talk show or whatever I've done, I've always tried to bring the best to the equation, always tried to have a positive attitude. I had two older brothers and two younger sisters. And my mother was very good at creating a competitive environment. So I was always like insanely competitive. I always wanted to win. I always wanted to be the best at everything because my mother used to pull out my two older brother's report cards and say things like, John got an A plus in physics and you only got an A, you know? And no matter what, it was never good enough. If I got all A pluses, well, it wasn't the hardest school. So I was always, you know, my mother, oh, I'm gonna have to shut off this phone, sorry. No problem. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, and that is my assistant calling me, even though she knows that I'm doing. And speaking of never being good enough, you called your mom and you never call your mom, even though you call her every day. You know, I call my mother every day. My mother's 91 years old. Mine too. It's <laughs> my mother is Sicilian. It is never enough. I call her, hi ma, how you doing? You never call. Or sometimes she says, <laughs> Who's this? She knows perfectly my mom, well. My mom is Napoletano and she, her line is not that you never call. It's just when I say, so have you heard, who have you heard from lately? Oh, nobody, nope. You alone <laughs> calls me. <laughs> now my mother says, nobody calls me. And five minutes into the call, oh, I have to go. I have another call every time. You People wanna. call her all day long. And by the way, I have a friend named Ernest Lupinacci. How's that for a name? And he was on his way to LA. He was out on Long Island. I said, don't get on a plane. Stop and see my mother. He ended up staying for a week. Really? He wow. ended up staying with her for a week, right? Can she you cook? imagine? Did she cook? She, not really. I mean, my mother is a Sicilian mother, but she was the youngest of like 4,000 children and everybody cooked for her. <laughs> so my mother, my mother is not like a typical Italian mother in that respect. Indeed. She cooks lasagna every, you know, five years. Got you. Um, in the uh, chat room, where there, there's a lot of chatter in the chat room. Uh, let's see here. So um, Amy Alt said there was a Carvel across the street from her father's store. Turco Ono. Now, did she like vanilla or chocolate? I think Amy, she was the one who said, love caramel chocolate bonnet. <laughs> uh, Turco Ono says, life is the journey, not the destination. And then Kathy Cato says, ice cream is the destination, which is- Ice the cream is the destination. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, we, we already got a question. Turco Ono wants to know, what's the best author you ever worked with, whether they became famous or not? That is a very good question. I, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of people and some of them were just incredible human beings, like so many of them. I fell madly in love with a lot of the novelists. Wally Lamb, who was the most extraordinary writer, he wrote a book called She's Come Undone and another one called I Know This Much Is True, which is now airing on HBO with Mark Ruffalo. Oh my God. Uh, I starring a phenomenal, phenomenal writer and a phenomenal human being. I, incredible. I, I, I gotta tell you, I watched the first episode of that. It was harrowing with Ru there Mark it Ruffalo, is. it's brilliant. Um, yeah, it's very dark, but it's beautiful. And the book is drop dead incredible. And he's a an really extraordinary, incredible human being. Uh, Jess Walter, another novelist who was amazing. You know, I've worked with a lot of celebrities. Howard Stern, of course, was so much fun. I learned a tremendous amount from him. There's so many, you know, it's really hard. It's like children and, you know, who's your favorite child? Right, right. You know, right. I love them and hate them sometimes. <laughs> You know, you love them all. I, I've loved them all. And it's, it's really been quite an extraordinary journey. Um, Wayne Simmons has joined us. Uh, John Trafero has joined us. Becky Safel asks a question. You became very successful in the genre of investigation. How did that come about? Uh, when I was an investigative reporter? Um, you know, I just kind of lucked into that. I was working in Boston um, one summer in, after I graduated and I was, I, had, I was running out of money and needed another job. So I went over to the career planning office at Harvard and I walked in and the woman there said to me, do you have an appointment with the National Enquirer? 
And I suppose in true National Enquirer fashion, I said, why, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I didn't. And uh, they brought me into a room and they interviewed me and then they invited me. This was back in the 70s. They invited me to go to Florida for lunch and I thought it was the most exotic, incredible thing. So I'm going to go to Florida for lunch. Of course I'm going to go to Florida for lunch. So I went to Florida for lunch and met a man by the name of Ian Calder, who ran the National Enquirer, was an extraordinarily brilliant man and taught me so much. And he said to me, I don't care where you went to school. I don't care who your parents are. I don't care anything about you. If green monkeys could do this job, we'd hire green monkeys. Do you think you can do it? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so they put me on a tryout for six weeks. And basically it was a sink or swim tryout. Go and get the story. Go, go and ask Mia Farrow why she divorced Frank Sinatra. And within a day I had found her and asked her that question. And they were so impressed. They offered me a job. All right, let's, let's, let's um, actually. And that was before the internet, by the way, when you couldn't like search for things. You had to actually do what? That was before electric typewriters. Oh, wow. Um, and so this, what, I'm, what I just put up is the documentary about the National Enquirer that just came out called Scandalous, the Untold Story of the National Enquirer. And I was fortunate enough when I was in LA to go to the, one of the openings that you, you um, one of the premieres, and this, everybody, I'm telling you, this is a phenomenal movie. This is not just a history of the National Enquirer. This is a examination of how politics operate, how the press operates in this country, how the media operates. Uh, tell, us, tell us one of the kookier stories from this era. You were one of the leading renegades in this crowd. Of well, first of all, Mark Landsman made that film and he's an incredible filmmaker. He did an amazing job and he, that film is about how tabloid culture, which the National Enquirer really represented, became all culture. And Donald Trump, as I've said, is the ta ultimate tabloid president. I mean, I did a lot of wacky stories when I was there. You know, I chased all kinds of people. And one of the, I, I became sort of well known for doing the human interest stories. And so, for instance, there were Siamese twins who were being separated. They were craniopagus Siamese twins attached at the tops of their heads. And they sent me to try to get the exclusive rights to their story. And they didn't really want to make a deal with anybody. And the National Enquirer, rather crassly, authorized me to offer them, and back, back this was in the 70s, $150,000, offered to build them a house, and this was an extraordinary couple. They had no money. He worked at a grocery store making, you know, a buck 70 an hour. They lived in this tiny little house, didn't even have a refrigerator. And they were facing, you know, a really dramatic, heartbreaking moment, should they separate these girls. And by the way, if they survived the separation, they were gonna be the first Siamese twins in history with fused brains to survive. So imagine having to make that decision. And here this idiot National Enquirer reporter shows up in your living room. But as is my philosophy, which is you make every moment count, you know, you try to do the best that you can. You know, we became friends and had a relationship that lasted for decades. And I would go back every year and write stories about them. And they didn't want to take money. Uh, they didn't want to profit off of their children. Uh, and they were really extraordinary people. They, the Siamese twins, did survive the operation. Great. They did have some issues, but they went on to have other children as well. And I always like to say they were miracle children with miracle parents because they were the most devoted, loving, extraordinary people, and they taught me so much. So that was probably one of my most favorite stories. And there are many, many more of people who were facing shark attacks and mothers who took their children around the country and you know, struggle to find cures for their illnesses. And just, that's kind of what I specialized in. Where did the, how did the National Enquirer have such a deep war chest to be able to pay out that kind of money for? Well, when I was there in the 70s, it was the most successful publication in America. And it had a circulation of 20 million, which was extraordinary. And so they actually made a lot of money. And the man who ran it, Generoso Pope, who was the scion of the Pope family and uh, somewhat famously tied to his parents or his father was, was famously tied to mobsters in New York. 
Um, and I never knew whether or not that was true or not, but that was sort of the story at the time. Yeah. He used the money he got from the family to buy an old rag and turned it into a, fam a family newspaper and turned it into an enormous success. He was actually quite a genius, graduated from MIT when he was quite young, uh, was a real innovator. And it was his vision, in fact, that, that made that paper what it was. He was a genius. And he also, probably because he knew and understood psychology, he invented checkout counters in the supermarket, right? So impulse buying was, was more or less kind of his invention. It was he that was that's an great. extraordinary man. That was in the documentary, which I'm going to again show the image of because I really want people to see this, um, how he had, no one had done that yet. No one had set up a little kiosk by the register. And I remember growing up seeing it. It was always there. And You'd walk by and, and see, you know, oh, Elizabeth that? Taylor got fat again. Yeah. She can't find love. And you go, oh my God, I can't either. I got fat too. Yeah. If she can't find love, who can? It's only a buck. It's only 75 cents. Let's grab the paper. Throw 25 it. cents. 25 cents. Wow. Back then. Yeah, it was really wow. cheap. Another cheap entertainment. Another question, which I love this question. Turco Ono always has great questions. He's one of our regular audience members. Patricia, Pris, Patricia Whitcast is with us. Andrew Einhorn just showed up. Andrew! Yes. <laughs> Andrew Einhorn. Hi, Andrew. Alan Peterson's here. Turco says, what would the 13-year-old Judith Regan say about the Judith Regan you've evolved into and the journey you took? Wow. First of all, if you had told me at 13 that this would have been my journey, I would have been shocked. I mean, it has been... I was very ambitious, um, but you know, I came from nowhere and I came out of nothing. And I had tremendous ambition and desire and drive, but I never knew my life would become as exciting and interesting as it has. Um, and you never, know, you never know what's gonna happen in life. I mean, I always wanted to have, um, you know, I always envisioned that I would have sort of more successful relationships with my children's fathers than I did. One of them passed away. The other one was a very challenging person. Um, but I, I'd say enjoy the ride. I mean, that's what I'd say. To, and I pretty much knew that at 13, that no matter what happens in life, and I have a son who's almost 40. He'll be 40 this year. I have a daughter who's 28. What do you, I what do you, I, like uh, <laughs> female Dorian Gray? <laughs> I adopted my niece's children who are 18 and 13, and I have two grandchildren. Uh, and you just, you never know in life what twists and turns you're gonna take. I mean, look at what happened in the last few months with all of us dealing with the threat of death and destruction all around us. Yeah. So you always have to maintain a positive attitude and you always have to enjoy the ride, no matter how treacherous, no matter how wonderful, you have to go into it with an optimistic spirit. And I think because I was always very artistic and I read a lot and I loved music and art that, you know, the, 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 the human condition and the human journey is always something that meant so much to me and something that I've kind of been a student of. And it's also so much a part of the work that I've done in my life, whether it's publishing books or being a talk show host, which I was for 24 years or raising children or, you know, just living in the world, you, you start to see that if you don't enjoy the ride, you're not going to enjoy anything because it's all about the ride. When you were doing these stories um, at the National Enquirer, did you start to imagine then, hey, you know, maybe I should publish my own things. You know, maybe I should, these are interesting. Are these, you know, did that, that relate to you becoming a book publisher? You mean my desire, my writing? I mean, yeah, I, I've always been a writer and I've always loved stories and I've always loved either reading or writing or working with people and helping them tell their stories. And that's, uh, publishing was a natural thing for me to do because it was, you know, what I loved. Like sharing, right? Yeah. Like sharing, yeah. yeah. Uh, the chat room's going nuts again. Make every moment count. Kathy Cato, who's um, a guest, was a guest on the show Monday, uh, she's the Queen's World Film Festival director, says, when I grew up, I want to be just like Judith. Oh, <laughs> be careful what you wish for. 
Marco <laughs> Ono says, my mother read The Inquirer for 40 plus years. Wally Green, who was also a guest on the show. Uh, Wally's an amazing guy um, who's on this week. He's a table tennis pro and just a wonderful person. Um, he said, wow, a son who's 40. You look amazing. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> um, everybody wants to be you. Callie Greenberg wants to be you. Oh, no, 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 no. We just got uh, uh, another additional audience member, Oku Onura, a good friend of mine who's one of the J Jamaican dub poets who started dub poetry in Jamaica. And I'm... Love I don't know why, but somebody just typed in support Ben and Jerry's, okay? I, there I think you go. Carvel and Ben and Jerry's. Ben and Jerry's very I cool. Heard. They're doing a lot of good political things. I want to bring up a, to uh, a, a copy, a cover of one of the books that you've published that you, I still haven't read, but you love this and you always are telling me, you got to read this, Robert. Sometimes this amazing things happen. Sometimes amazing things happen. So my friend... Ernest Lupinacci just so happened, I was meeting with him and he was meeting a friend in the lobby of Bellevue Hospital. We had a meeting there, believe it or not, just by coincidence. Anyway, the friend was going off to visit this woman, who, Dr. Elizabeth Ford, who ran the Bellevue Prison Ward, which was patients from Bellevue who were having psychiatric, uh, from Rikers, who were having psychiatric issues and they would be taken to Bellevue. And so I spent about an hour chatting with her and she was so fascinating. And the work that she was doing was so important that I asked her to write this book and she did an amazing job. And it's really about the intersection of poverty, neurological issues, child abuse, trauma, and so many things that don't get the acknowledgement that they should. Uh, and if you want to, and you know this better than anyone, Robert, for, because you've done work in the prisons. If you look at why people are at Rikers, there's, and you know, the problems that people have, it's wow. usually, you know, a combination of childhood trauma, yep. you know, um, addiction, poverty, abandonment. Yeah. abandonment. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I saw this in my own family. My sister had MS, diabetes. She had two children. She passed away. Her children lived with my mother for a while. Then one of them uh, became, you know, had substance abuse issues and she had children. And for a while, the, the youngest one who was three at the time lived with me, but then child protection Took, took her away and gave her back to her mother. And then it was a horrible bumpy road from there with in and out and horrible men and you know sexual abuse and not going to school. And just, you know, you could see how a lack of parenting, a lack of guidance, a lot of trauma, you know, really results in a, in a really terrible situation for so many people. So I basically, after years of fighting with child protection and this one and that, I literally just took them. And I went to court and I spent two years litigating and I got custody of them because they were gonna die on the street. Um, and uh, you know, it's better to start at the beginning to take care of people. It's better to start early on in life instead of you pay now or you're gonna pay later. Yeah. And sometimes amazing things happen by the way is is a book that Dr. Ford uh, really writes about how with the right help in the right situation, sometimes amazing things happen. People can get better, even people who have serious, serious mental health issues. A lot of them need medication. If they're schizophrenic, if they have you know, bipolar, there are ways to treat people. She treated her patients with incredible dignity and love and kindness. And you know, there's a reason that things go awry. And I think we need to take a closer look at that, pay greater attention. If there's anything that people can do that's important, it's actually helping children. You know, volunteer, be a big brother, big sister, tutor. Yep. Get involved, you know, help people. Because it is incredible how the smallest things can make such a difference in somebody's life. So let's go from that positive, wonderful extreme in that book that you published to the most, another recent book you published, which is the opposite extreme of understanding, patience, kindness. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> from, 
How did uh, Trump? Yeah, well, Mark Halperin interviewed 75 political uh, thought makers and leaders uh, and strategists, uh, and they outlined for him what needs to be done to beat Trump in this election. It's a very, very smart book, very smart book. Um, he's, he, uh, I don't know if we, it sounds like you just kind of stopped there because maybe we just don't want to even waste more breath on this particular human being. If we well, look, I mean, I, I do think his behavior is endlessly disgraceful and embarrassing and heartbreaking and damaging, um, you know, and it's, it's like, I don't even know why the media covers it as much as they do. Because it's, it's like a big, ugly reality show that we all have to witness every day. And we're seeing the fallout of some of the bad decisions that are made and the hatred and the vicious tweeting. And it's, I can't even believe that the president of the United States is as undignified and inhumane as he is. It's just too shocking to me. And if he's a reflection of who we are, uh, you know, I don't think he's a reflection of the entire culture. I really don't. I think that there are a lot of amazing, dignified, loving, kind-hearted, caring people out there. Um, and, you know, one of the great things about the demonstrators is that there are a lot of people who actually care. And that's a beautiful thing. I wish they weren't doing it during a time of COVID because it's incredibly dangerous and the spread is going to increase exponentially which is so alarming to me. And my father just died of COVID, uh, which was the saddest thing I've ever witnessed in my life because I couldn't be with him. And I had to watch him suffer on a Facebook portal. Uh, and if you watch somebody die of COVID, they suffocate. They suffocate. It's like drowning for two weeks. It is a painful, horrible, horrifying death. And you die alone. And nobody should go through that, nobody. It is the most heartbreaking of any disease. And there he is, he was a very handsome man, Leo Regan. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful man. Such a great father, what is so his name? kind. What is his what? name? His name is Leo. 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 Yeah, he was a beautiful human being, sensitive, artistic, musical, a major reader never said an unkind thing about anyone except for Richard Nixon and Donald Trump. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> you could really get him going with those two things. But, you know, honestly, it's people have to take this seriously. There are a lot of people who, um, you know, can spread it. They can be contaminated. Yeah. They can be contagious and not know it. The tests are not foolproof. You know, there's a 30 to 40% false negative. So you could have it and be spreading it. And a lot of young people may have it and be spreading it. And that's why it's alarming to me to have tens of thousands of people demonstrating because the masks don't protect you fully. Yeah. And they're very close to each other. And I'm just terrified that the spread is going to become so wildly out of control and millions of people can potentially die from that. And that is a very serious thing. And having just watched my father suffer and die, it's not something I wish on anybody. We have a few people in the um, chat offering some condolence. Wally Green, sorry for your loss. Um, Callie says, wow, you're, you're a survivor, um, sending you love. Turco Ono wants to know, did he serve in World War II? He did serve in World War II at 17, and he also served in the Korean War. Uh, it's by the way, it's ten thirty, which means our show's over. This is a half hour show, but if you're willing to stick around for a few minutes. We'll do. Are you dear? <laughs> we'll go into overtime, and the way we go into overtime is we play a game called Five Objects. So I'm going to show you five objects that is because of this quarantine. I've been in my house. I've been like, what? I still have that? Or oh, thank God, I still have that. So I'm going to show you five objects, and you just give me your gut reaction to them. And we'll start with a microphone. Oh boy, makes me want to sing. <laughs> okay. And I've heard you're singing, it's beautiful. <laughs> All right, here's another one. What is that? This is one of these, like a 
A good luck a piece. It's a like good luck. Oh, oh wow. wow. I think I need to put that next to my bed. I'll have, to, I'll, I'll have to send it to you. <laughs> you'll have Imagine to, your flowers. You'll have to sit it outside your apartment for a week so it's, it's safe. <laughs> Here's the next one. A staple gun. A staple gun. You know, I haven't used a staple gun in 400 years. I don't staple things anymore. I scan them. That's <laughs> called obsolete. <laughs> oh, my God. I know. All right, here we go. This goes in with the flowers behind me. Okay, can I tell you something? This is something that during the pandemic, many of my friends have taken up, which is gardening. There are two things that people started doing, gardening and baking. Yes, baking. Baking, I published a book called Bien Cui. We sold out in a month. I mean, yeah, yeah. All unbelievable. Right. Here's the last one, a pair of gold sneakers. Oh, I love that. I want those. <laughs> I knew you want these. They're not your size. Oh, no. I think you should wear them. They're beautiful. I want a pair of gold sneakers. How, is, how, how are your plants doing on your balcony? Uh, you know what? They're so beautiful. And by the way, I'll have you know, I'm growing sprouts and basil in my living room. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, one of the things I did with my children, I sent them trays that they could grow sprouts in. And they are all very proudly sheltering in and growing things in their living room. Uh, that's, that's hilarious. Yeah. Let, let's look at that. By the way, you look great. Thank you. You like, you, my, great. you like my haircut? Love your haircut. Love the beard trim, love the haircut. You look 20 years younger. Thank you. You what? know, sheltering in has been good for you. <laughs> yeah, from, the, from, the, from this line up. What, what about, what do you think about uh, darkening this up? Everyone says, get rid of the gray and darken it up. I just feel like it's, you know, it's not real. I think it would uh, be fake, but... You know, if, as long as it doesn't look fake. Okay. All you right. can shave it. Yeah, if I shave it, then I'm going to look like I just ate 10 pounds of pasta. Tell us about this book. Is this oh, my God. Book? So this is a bakery in Brooklyn. Bien Cui means well done. He was a chemist who became a baker. He's world famous. You know, he's had major, major, major recognition from all the uh, food publications and James Beard and blah, blah, blah. And I gave this to, I had a house guest here about six months ago and I gave it to him. And he told me that it literally has gotten him through the pandemic. Oh. What is with my phone? I shut it off. I don't know oh. why my phone is doing it. Oh, it happens. Oh, you know who that is? That's my daughter. Let's bring her on. Bring her on the show. <laughs> Except. Hi, Laura. Can you see her? No. No. I'm on. I'm doing a podcast. I'll call you back, sweetie. Can I see who? No. Can we oh. see you? How long is your podcast? About another half hour. I love you. I'll talk okay, to you later you or tomorrow. Love you. Love you. Bye. Sorry about that. I don't know why I shut it off, but it's ringing on my hard are, line. This is, this is, you know, my, my, the network producers like it when these moments happen. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Authenticity. Um, Amy Alt in the chat says, thank you for talking about the seriousness of COVID. Michael Swisscase says, something about the American ethos compels many to throw caution to the wind. Uh, yeah. Amy, Amy says, I'd like to hire Judith as my life coach. Uh, Anytime. <laughs> Andrew Einhorn says, go, go until 1130. Uh, <laughs> Andrew. Andrew. Uh, my brother wants to know who's your favorite musical artist. Oh, boy. You know, it, it, I don't even know where to begin, honestly. I have, I have such eclectic taste in music. I mean, I love everyone from Peggy Lee and Frank Sinatra to the Beatles, to classical artists, to jazz, to R&B, to Britney Spears. I mean, and Mariah you, Carey. And, and you sing too. What's your favorite style to sing? I like to sing ballads. You know, I love ballads. Nice. Yeah. Um, Good old ballads. Turco Ono wants to know, can you- By the way, before I forget, have you, I just listened to this morning, Peggy Lee singing, Is That All There Is? No. It, okay, everyone needs to make a note of this and go and listen to it. Okay. It was written by Lieber and Stoller. Mike Stoller lives up the hill from me. He's the sweetest man who ever lived. Uh, he wrote Hound Dog. He wrote so many amazing songs. Uh, but listen to that song and listen to Peggy Lee doing it. You can listen to it on YouTube. 
Yeah. If that's all there is, my friend, then let's keep dancing. Okay. All right. All that's right. a lyric. Sounds like it's, it's a good Beautiful. Movie. And the way she does it, so incredible. Turco Ono wants to know, can you comment on the following? It's a little list, so pick and choose. Rupert Murdoch, O.J. Simpson, Christopher Darden, Jane Friedman, Donald Trump. So we did Trump. Um, <laughs> All right. So who's the first? Rupert Murdoch? Murdoch, yeah. He's very yeah. old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Christopher Darden, O.J. Simpson. So I published Christopher Darden's book, which was called In Contempt. Uh, it was the best selling of all of the OJ related books. It, and by the way, incredible book, ghost written by Jess Walter, who went on to become nominated for a National Book Award and is an amazing, amazing world famous writer now. It was one of the first books he ever ghost wrote. Uh, Christopher Darden, I thought was a really interesting man in the middle of a very complicated situation. Um, you know, it was a very tough situation for him, you know, being a black prosecutor yeah. at a time, you know, during this big controversial trial. O.J. Simpson, um, you know, I interviewed him. Yeah. Um, he confessed. Uh, there is a really interesting, you know, two hour interview that they aired on Fox, which was the interview I did with him 13 years ago. All you have to do is watch that and make up your own mind about him and about what happened. He's somebody who was incapable of taking responsibility for what he did and a celebrity and, um, you know, a sociopath. What was it like uh, sitting across looking into this murderer's eyes? Uh, you know what? It was, I had a job to do. I had to keep a straight face. Um, I had people from law enforcement, FBI guys and a CSI guy contact me after they saw the interview. And um, they all said the same thing to me, which was, we train people to do what you did, which was to keep a straight face, non-judgmental, and just ask him questions. And because I did that in that interview and didn't criticize him and you know, make disparaging remarks about what he did to him. I just simply asked him questions with a straight face, no emotions, kept very still in the moment, and he started to open up. And you can see it. It's a really compelling I've, I've interview. Seen it's that. on fox.com if you want to watch it. I the, think it's also on YouTube now, too. Is you it The Lost it. Confession? Yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty amazing moment. Um, uh, Callie Greenberg says, you had such a poker face during that interview. <laughs> That's what Joanna Malloy said. Remind me never to play poker with you. Uh, <laughs> Becky Savelle uh, said, oh my God, I love the version by Peggy Lee. So you've got somebody else who already knows Yay! that. Um, well, you and I actually, had, we saw a movie together that we both couldn't keep a poker face on. Remember, what, I don't even remember the name of it. The, the one everybody the raised. One that won the Academy Award. Yeah. Um, Parasite. Parasite. Ah, oh, man. We, it, was, it was not worth keeping a poker face. It was just <laughs> worth walking out. It was, it was 10 minutes, 10 minutes in, it was like, wait, is this really happening? I don't know how everyone else out there feels about it, but uh, we're not big fans of that. No, 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 no. Um, no. I got another What's question. your favorite movie, Robert? I got a few, so I don't know I can say one, but um, I still love American Graffiti, and I think it's a lost classic. No one talks about it ever. Yeah. Um, I love, um, I love Castaway. I like Taxi Driver. I like the gritty, kind of the gritty stuff. Dog Day Afternoon, because it was based on a real story. Incredible. Wow. Yeah. I like, what I'm watching now is Dead to Me. Have you watched Dead to Me yet? On I Netflix? haven't. Oh my gosh. You have to watch this on Netflix. It's so okay. good. Oh, okay. It's twisted. We'll do that. I'll so they, do that. Do what about The Wizard of Oz? I feel like you're in the field of poppies. Yep, I like they're, it. They're yeah, field they're, of yeah. tulips. <laughs> you you yeah. look like Dorothy in the field of tulips. As long as I'm not a midget, one of the midgets. I, no. I'd, I'd the be munchkins. The lollipop. munchkins. Lollipop. lollipop gang, lollipop gang. I love the lollipop gang. Um, all right, so let's look at some more book covers and, and uh, let's see what we got here. I'm just gonna flip through these like we're sitting at the kitchen table. Oh, there you are again with OJ. Yeah. Look at that look. 
Tell us about this. That's the little girl that uh, I adopted when she was three or well, not when she was three. She just turned, she just graduated from high school yesterday. She lived with me when she was three years old. This is when she was living with me, Isabella. Isn't she beautiful? Beautiful. So beautiful. Such a beautiful girl. And that's Dita Von Tees. I published her book, ah, yeah. uh, The Art of the Tees, and we went to her book party. Isabella, this was her first book party. I'll have to send her that picture. <laughs> so I got a question. We've talked about this before. What are writers to do today? What, the dream of writing a novel yeah. and having it published. It's rough. It's very rough. Uh, you know, try. There are lots of different things you can do. You can try to get a publisher, try to get an agent who can try to sell it to a publisher. You know, where there's a will, there's a way. You can also self-publish, uh, which is a lot easier than it used to be. Uh, you know, occasionally people come to me and they want me to do all the production and help them with the editorial and the design and things like that. Uh, you can certainly do it on Amazon. They have a self-publishing program. It's all paperback and the quality is like so-so and you have to figure out their systems are quite difficult, but you know, you can do it. I think, I think uh, if you're an artist and you're compelled, uh, you must do it and that's it. And you perfect it and you work on it and you find a way. Marketing is, is, is the hard thing. If you've written an incredible book, uh, one of the challenges is to find your audience. It's not easy because everyone, everyone has a voice now, right? There's people out yeah. there, you know, on their social media and doing podcasts and having opinions about everything. So it's increasingly more difficult to rise above all of the noise in the culture. Yeah. There's certainly a lot more access than there used to be, which is wonderful, but it's crowded. So it's hard. I say everything should become local, right? So start small, start with your friends, your neighbors, the people in your community, the people that you can reach out to, build it from there, brick by brick by brick. And every connection you make with another human being is meaningful, right? If you have an audience of 10, you have a great audience. Those yeah. are 10 people that are invested in something that you have to say, and you care about them, and you care about it, and you care about what you have to say. And that's really the most important thing. You know, my son uh, and his daughter now, because of, because of the pandemic, are on the verge of losing their businesses. It's been very challenging for them. And my son is, you know, feels, I think, you know, really disappointed in himself that he's not going to be able to necessarily survive the business isn't going to be able to survive this hit. And a lot of people are facing wow. that, Yeah, you know, and I think we measure ourselves so often by numbers and by, you know, box office and by how many and how much and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I have to tell you, my son, there is no better father on this planet than my son. He is the father that his father never was. Uh, he is loving, kind, compassionate, you know, he has a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and the two children that I ended up adopting are now living with him. Little Ethan, who's 13 years old, Patrick, my son, took him on a ski trip. They bonded, and Ethan doesn't know who his father is. And he's like, I really want to have a dad. Can I go live with Patrick? I really want to have a dad. And so I called Patrick, and I said, hey, you know, what do you think? He said, I'll ask my wife. And he called me back the next day, you know, oh, love to have him. Beautiful. You know, I said, you need to measure yourself as a human being and the contribution you're making every day to the world around you, to the people around you. That's how we should all be measuring ourselves. And if we can contribute to our communities, I don't care how big or how small or medium sized, if it's just your next door neighbor, do something for somebody else. That is the key to happiness and leading a fulfilling life. It's incredible how almost either I have good friends or everybody is a good person because every guest I've had on has in some way said something as essentially beautiful as you just said. Oh. Um, and so there is so much. You have good. a good community. I think I have a good community because there is so yeah. much good in the face of all this bad. Um, How could you not have a good community with all those tulips behind I, was, <laughs> I knew you were gonna, <laughs> I knew that was coming. Uh, John Trefero says, great human advice. M Michelle Kaminer, hi, Michelle, popped. She said, Yay! so true. Um, and, and James Turcott says, how do you feel about small publishers? And I think you kind of 
touched on it here just now. It's like yeah. I, small publishers. It doesn't matter the size. Again, the size really doesn't matter, right? It's about your commitment to right. saying something that matters. Yep. That's what matters. And sharing it in a meaningful way with as many people that you can reach out to. And if your publisher can help you in any way, you know, sometimes the small publishers are more invested in helping you, you know, and, yep. and it's, it's finding the right person that you can connect with, who can help you to, to say what you want to say. So, let, the, so seeing as you're giving free advice, Wally Green, who um, was on the show, Wally escaped gang, um, a gang lifestyle at the age of 13. He had a gun and multiple guns and whatnot. He's in the chat uh, and he found ping pong. So this black kid from Brooklyn finds ping pong and now is flying around the world, killing, just knocking people out with his ping pong paddle. I love that. Um, and he tells a story about how he went to North Korea to play in North Korea and no one would go with him. No one wanted him to go and he went. So he's, his question is, so I'm thinking about writing a book about my life titled From the Pistol to the Paddle. After I write the book, what are the next three steps? Promoting it. <laughs> I mean, you have, to, you, you, know, you have to find someone who can help you to put it together. You need to tell the right story. You know, and I mean, I could talk to him if he wants to have a conversation sure. about that and help yeah. him. Um, and then you have to get out there and, and share it with people and find a way to connect with them and promote it uh, and live your life and continue to do great work. Awesome. Uh, Callie Greenberg wants to know, what's your view on poetry? Do you ever publish poetry? Do you have a favorite poem? You know, it's really funny. I, it's so funny because I woke up this morning the first thing I did when I got out of bed this morning was to go onto Amazon and to order an anthology of poetry, the Oxford Anthology of Poetry, which I had as a kid. I grew up with that poetry book by my bed, side, on my bedside table. And every night before I went to bed, I read poems. Mm. I love poetry. I ordered the book to send to my children because I want them to have that. And I think, you know, poetry is it. I mean, I absolutely love it. It's very hard to sell. Occasionally things, you know, break through. Um, there are a couple of poets now that, you know, have done well in the last couple of years. I think it's a really beautiful, beautiful art form, you know, and it comes in many form, whether, forms, whether it's song lyrics or rap yeah. or slam poetry, you know, the spoken word, there's so many great, ways to communicate and poetry to me is one of the finest finest things i try to read poetry all the time I just, Shift poetry i just got three, three of my poems published in this book of poetry i love that congratulations Thank you. that's fabulous yeah it's fun um let's look at another book that you published and it, tell me there was a couple of other photos that came along with this i'm curious yeah francis ford coppola the godfather notebook so when Francis Ford Coppola uh, directed those movies, this book is how he took the book, The Godfather by Mario Puzo, whose last book I published, which was called The Family. It was how he took that, he, how he took The Godfather. If you go through this book, it is the actual manuscript by Mario Puzo with Francis Ford Coppola's notes and how he breaks down the entire book into 50 scenes. Wow. If you want to see inside the mind of a brilliant director and writer, Francis Ford Coppola is also a writer. He did not write the Godfather book, uh, yeah. Mario Puzo did, but he worked with Mario putting the movie together. And it's a brilliant analysis. It's the exact replica of this notebook that he and had. He used it like a prompt book. He, he made the movie from the notebook. Do you go, in this case, and I'm going to ask you a follow-up, <laughs> do you go to somebody like them and say, hey, let's do a book? Or did they come to you and say, hey, we have this idea? How'd that come together? So in this case, he actually um, had somebody approach me. Uh -huh. uh, it comes you know, to me in different ways. Very often, I'll have ideas and go to people or people submit things to me, or, you know, in this case, it was brought what, to me through somebody who knew him. What's the, what's the one that got away? Is there, is there the one that got away? Yeah, you wished you could have done it, or either it got away. Really. 
Is there one, is there one that a competitor has done that, not that you, you knew about it, but it came out and you were like, oh, that's great. You know, wish that was- I mean, you know, there are books, you know, I don't, I can't remember any offhand, but through the years, you know, you yeah. look and you go, oh, I love that book. I wish I would have published that yeah. or I could have published that, you know. There's so many, there's so many great books, so many. There he is. And there he is. What an extraordinary man. We're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the first uh, Godfather wow. movie. Yeah, it's so incredible. And there's so many great stories of behind the scenes, you know. Nobody, nobody wanted Al Pacino. Nobody wanted Marlon Brando. We published a special edition of that notebook, which costs $500. It's very expensive, and it's signed by him. And it's the actual notebook. We only did, you know, a yeah. few copies. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, and it comes with his casting notes. They're all handwritten. He's an amazing, he's a genius. He's a creative genius and works really hard. Andrew Einhorn has a question. Judith, you are so inspirational and a class act. Who do you look up to or have in the past for inspiration? You know, I, the most inspiring person in my life, without a doubt, was my grandmother. She was the most extraordinary person. She was quite old when I was born because my mother was the youngest of nine children. <clears throat> she had my mother when she was in her 40s. So she was, you know, she was an older woman when I, and I lived with her when I was little, up until I was about 10 years old. Uh, we lived in the house with my grandparents. My grandparents were from Sicily. They were Sicilian immigrants. And my grandmother came from a part of Sicily that didn't even have schools. So she was illiterate. She was an immigrant, um, you know, and she was generous and kind and giving. And she and my grandfather had beautiful gardens and they were amazing, you know, agricultural experts, fruit trees, and they had animals and they made their own cheese and sausage and blah, 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 blah. But the one thing that they did uh, was always give the best to people who needed it. So they would pick their tomatoes and always the best tomatoes they taught me had to go to other people, right? So that's how I grew up. I mean, she was really my guiding light my whole life. She was, she was the one. That's incredible. That's beautiful. We have, you and I have a lot in common because my grandmother was that kind of an influence on me. And similarly, um, from a very poor background, but hardworking, and very giving. And my, mother, and my grandmother never complained, never. I taught her how to write her name when I was five years old. She Beautiful. had never written her name, yeah. Love that. Yeah. John Trafero says, that's amore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike, Michael Swiss K has a little trivia. He says, Cop Coppola's first choice for Don Corleone was Laurence Olivier. That he was on the list. In fact, in the casting notes, it's written. He actually did want Marlon Brando, but they didn't, Paramount didn't want Marlon Brando. Charlie Bluthorn did not want Marlon Brando because he was such a troublemaker and they made him audition and, uh, you know, they, they pay, it paid him scale. Really? Yeah, because he was, he was uh, known for being, you know. Moody. Difficult. Yeah. Um, Turco Ono wants to know, of the submissions that come to you, how many get rejected? against the number of those that get accepted? Well, uh, probably 99%. Yeah. You know, it's very hard to find stuff that we think we can sell. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not a good rate. <laughs> and my brother, I love this quote and he's right. And I'm gonna start saying this to, to people and my son, give your best tomatoes to others. I love that. I love that. Pull that out of your the, the, the slew Give your of best tomatoes to others. Give your best tomatoes to others. I love it. Great. You said it. All right. Let's go. Maria Zarba said it. Speaking I of, never. well, we're switching from tomatoes to bad apples here. Um, oh. You're an advocate of people who, you know, you, you take up the side of a lot of people, the underdogs, uh, people who are cast out, people who are looked down upon or ridiculed. Um, what compelled you to get involved in this? Are you, were you friends with? Uh, well, uh, Janice Dickinson was a witness in the Cosby trial and I received a call 
uh, from the prosecutor asking me if I would testify because Janice Dickinson had testified in that trial um, and she was a witness uh, in the trial and there she is. Um, and her testimony was that Bill Cosby had drugged and raped her. They tried to, his defense attorney claimed basically that she was along for the ride and she wanted fame and she was just trying to get attention. And, you know, she came into this and made up the story after the fact and blah, blah, blah. I was brought in to testify to the fact that when I published her memoir, which was called No Lifeguard on Duty, she told me and wanted to put in the book that story that Bill Cosby had drugged and raped her. And that was back in 2001, 2002. That's what happened. She told the ghostwriter, she told me, and the attorneys wouldn't let it in because there was no corroboration. So she was very upset about the fact that we had to take it out of the book. So that was the limited testimony uh, that I gave in that trial. And um, the uh, lawyer who was Bill Cosby's defense attorney, Tom Mesereau, who's quite a good lawyer, um, you know, tried to tear me apart on the stand. I think I stood up, stood up to him pretty well. Mm -hmm. And a couple of months after that, I was invited to a dinner party where he was the um, honored guest. And it was a dinner party for him. And I said to the guy who invited me, I'm not sure Tom Mesereau wants me, <laughs> wants me there. And so he asked Tom and Tom was like, no, nah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. So I came in, I was like, Tom, hi, all is fair in love and war. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, all right, we're gonna wind up in a few, but before we do, a couple comments from chat. I got a couple more questions. Jack Fuller says, Robert, is such a foundation for all you speak about, Judith. You're so special for being a part of Robert's community. Thanks for oh. sharing your wisdom and reality of life experiences that bring us together as this new life opens up to us. Wow, you have such a great community. Jack, Jack's brilliant. Jack, uh, Jack's a former tennis pro. He's out on the West Coast and he works with homeless. He started a homeless organi uh, organization to serve people experiencing homelessness. He's great. He also wow. wrote, he also wrote uh, the whole tomato thing's got everybody. Andrew Einhorn just put a picture of a tomato up. Oh. <laughs> he says, yes, our ancestors are a strength that we need to revisit and embrace the unconditional love that they gave us. Yeah. Yeah. She was amazing. That's um, what really matters, you know? I mean, it's very, I said to my son, um, you know, I, I think it's really important that everybody remember because we're so achievement oriented, you know, we're so results oriented. Yeah. And, you know, even though I tried to raise my children to be balanced, and of course, I want them to succeed at whatever they want to succeed in and so on. But sometimes you're going to fail and sometimes things aren't, aren't going to work. And sometimes the world just goes mad as it has. And, you know, you have to accept it and you have to be kind to everyone around you and enjoy and be happy in the discomfort of it all, yeah. you know, and not be so hard on yourself, you know. And I see this a lot in the culture that, you know, I didn't get to do this and I didn't make this amount of money and I didn't get to be number one. Well, this isn't the time to be number one. This is a moment of reflection and, you know, rethinking. And, you know, our job is to stay alive and to help everyone else stay alive. Uh, this question I wasn't going to ask, but I am going to ask, what's your take on, uh, I think it's HBO, pulling Gone with the Wind? out of the rotation? Well, you know, I'm somebody who's not into censorship at all. Yep. So that's kind of my bottom line. I think that uh, I just, I have, a, listen, people were upset that I interviewed OJ Simpson. They were really upset. They were really upset that I interviewed him. I always have believed in terms of being a publisher that everyone, no matter who they are, no matter what has happened, has a right to tell their story. The good, the bad, the ugly, the absurd, the obscene. And when we start saying, you can see this, but you can't see that, there are plenty of things that I don't want to see. There are plenty of things that I wish didn't exist, but I don't think that's one of them. I wouldn't have made that decision. It's not a decision I, because I just don't believe in any kind of censorship. I feel like the smarter choice, which is 
fairly obvious is to just if you want if they wanted to put a put something you know put a comment before it have somebody tape somebody or remake it or and remake then compare it. the two versions and be grateful that we've made progress in terms of our thinking um all right, so audience, this is your chance now to throw out any kind of thank yous and kudos because we're going to wind up so you can start throwing that in there. Um, before you do that, uh, I want to ask you, we're on a Zoom call, so I have to ask this question. Are you wearing pants? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> I normally do when I do interviews. <laughs> um, and then are you binge watching anything or are you watching anything? Do you have any suggestions for people to watch? Any particular shows or films? I, you know, I would I would check out. I know this much is true on yeah. HBO. Yeah, I it's actually it's very dark. It's really complicated. I was so surprised. I had to turn it off after. Yeah, because it's so right. Punch you in the chest. It really is. The other thing, uh, which is also dark, is the Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, okay. I watched that doc on uh, Netflix. They did a great job. Fantastic job. Um. All right, and let's see here. We got some shout outs here. Becky Savelle says, thank you, Judith, for being a part of this. You're such an inspiration. I agree with your view on censorship. Callie Greenberg says, preach. Becky also says, we need to have the conversation and process. Michelle Kaminar says, it's a time of vulnerability and being okay with that. Turco Ono says, it, it comes from your Esquire days, First Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> he does his research, he's awesome. Oh my God. <laughs> Michelle says, this was wonderful, thank you. My brother Andrew says, clap, clap, clap. Encore Judith, says Robert, Aww. and says John Trefero. Uh Judith Galinsky, thanks for all you do, says Michael. Um, all right, so the last question. I love your audience, uh, I do. Such great. great people, so many beautiful people. Kirko Ono says, great job, Robert and Judith, thank you for a wonderful evening. Colin Peterson says, thank you so much, Judith, and the man, Mr. Galinsky, you're both beautiful souls, and I hope that our paths intertwine in our journey of life. Thank you, Colin. Wow. Uh, last question is, what, seen as you said, we've got such a beautiful audience, we do. What's your call to action for this audience? Give the best tomatoes away. Oh, yes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yes. Give them your best tomatoes. And your best tomatoes. That's it. Your it's tomatoes. a beautiful thing. And by the way, I would give the best tomatoes to everyone in your audience tonight because they were pretty amazing. Thank you. What a group. Thank you. Thank you. Robert. Thank you. And thank all of, all of the people in your audience for being so kind and generous. Love it. They're throwing hearts That's up. Appreciated. Here's our final comment. Andrew Einhorn said, awesome hour. Please have Judith back as I think we have barely touched on her life and there's got to be so much more. I agree. Oh, um, so thank you for taking time out and sharing with us. Thank you. I thank you. It. Thank you. Thank you all. Ciao.